here in the audience has ever had feelings for a robot? That might sound like a philosophical question. But philosophy is born from wonder. That is what my high school philosophy professor used to say all the time. And what he meant was that philosophy stems from the wonderful realization that we humans exist in this world, and with us, the reality as we perceive it. I have very fond memories of those years, in those years, I learned to ask fundamental questions about life. Who are we? What is our purpose? In those years, when school was preparing me for life, I started to experience wonder in everything I was learning, from ancient Greek literature to history to biology and natural sciences. And I made this message mine. Philosophy is born from wonder. A few years later, I went to university to do a degree in bioengineering. And I must say, I didn't like it very much at the beginning. It wasn't so fun to study lots of basic math, electronics, electrotechnics. But at some point, I found myself inspired again. I discovered artificial intelligence. I started discussing about consciousness and emotions in humans and machines with my classmates and professor. And we used to do that in a villa's garden, not in the classroom. So that wasn't a very traditional lecture. And it felt like I was doing philosophy again, in a new way, a way that I had not known before. So I thought, perhaps I meant in life to bring together two different souls, one from humanities and one from engineering. Today, I'm an associate professor in intelligent interactive systems. I work with social robots. I build technology, and I work with humans. So what is a social robot? Until not so long ago, we were used to thinking of robots as tools that could do dull, dirty, dangerous tasks that we humans could not do or did not want to do. Tools that could do things in a much faster, more automated way. This is a modern car assembly line, for example. But today we know that robots can do much more, that they are so much more. Today we see robots in new roles, in scenarios where they provide not only physical support to humans, but also social support or even emotional support. Today we see robots tested as tutors for children, instructors in the factory, providers for therapy, and helpers and companions in elderly care. And these robots share a salient feature. To some extent, they resemble humans, even if this resemblance is minimal. They may have a head, a body, and arms. But these robots interact with humans at a very human level. That means that appearance is not enough. These robots need to have social skills. They need to be aware that they're interacting with another person. They need to be aware of the social signals that humans use to communicate. They need to understand people's intention and at the same time make their intentions known to them. They need to understand our emotions and respond in a way that is socially appropriate. Social robots will change our life. We will socially connect with them. And if we use in the right way, they will empower us and help ourselves to understand ourselves better. Connecting with others is a very deeply rooted human need. We connect with other people, we bond with them, we feel empathy for them, and this social bonding has been fundamental to promote cooperation among individuals, and that has helped us survival as a species. In fact, we are social animals, as Aristotle used to say. Research tells us that the more we like someone else, the more we feel affinity towards another person, the easier it is for us to trust that person and to establish a social connection with them. But this happens when we interact with another human. What happens when we interact with a robot? Robots are not humans. So can we, as humans, 
establish relationships with them, or feelings even. Well, we know that we humans bond with inanimate objects, although in a different manner from the way that we bond with other humans. We bond with cars, we bond with computers, we bond with dolls. You might remember the very deeply moving scene from the film Cast Away, where the protagonist, Chuck, loses Wilson, the football with the pain that human face. What an amazing power does a human face have? Think that babies are attracted to humans' faces from the very early days. So we are white for it. So humans bond with objects, and they also bond with robots, also with those that do not have a face, like this one. This is a vacuum cleaner, OK? So people anthropomorphize robots. We personify them. We treat them like people. We bond and feel empathy for robots that don't look like humans. But research shows us that human likeness, or the extent to which a robot looks or behaves like a human, does affect how we feel empathy for a robot. That the more human-like a robot is, the higher the chances that we feel empathy for it. So appearance does matter. But what we don't know yet is exactly how much. And that is something I'm interested in. And I'd like to show you something from our research. This is Yona. Yona is a robotic head, and uh, it's half physical and half virtual. It is made by a 3D physical mask and the video project a virtual face. So it's very easy to change Yona's face, face characteristics, expressions, and that makes it an ideal tool to study how we interact with robots. So what I'm interested in are the synergies between how a robot looks and how a robot behaves and how these affect the quality of interaction. So when do people socially connect with Yona? How should Yona look like in order for people to like it? In the 1970, a Japanese roboticist, Masahiro Mori, proposed the so-called Uncanny Valley hypothesis. According to this, the more a robot looks like a human, the higher is people's level of affinity for it, but only up to a certain threshold, where we experience a sudden decrease in the robot's likability. And at that point, feelings of eeriness and the familiarity emerge. So there are still many open questions here, but it seems like this effect might be related to a violation of our expectation. When the robots don't behave in a way that we expect. For example, when a robot is very human-like in its appearance, but also very robotic-like in its behavior. So together with my collaborators, I conducted an experiment with Yona to understand the relations between uncanniness and social connection. So we designed several faces for this robot, some more human-like, some less. And we wanted to see if people were able to mimic the robot's facial expressions. What we know is that aligning our behavior to that of someone else, for example, by mimicking it, is a sign of social connection and is very closely related to our ability to understand others which is at the basis of uh, social interaction. So here you will see people mimicking Jonas laughter. So we analyzed people's facial expressions and found that people are able to mimic the robot even when it's perceived as more threatening. But we also found that the more uncanny the robot was perceived, the more difficult it was for people to recognize emotions expressed by the robot. So it seems like we can socially react to the robot even when it has uncanny traits, but in other ways, Uncanniness affects our ability to connect with the robot in other ways. 
So what is the right level of human likeness that we should build in a robot? This is still an open question, a question that's very relevant for those robots that are very human-like, almost looking like a human, but not quite. And you know why this is important? Not only because human-like robots will live with us in the future, but also because answering this question can teach us something about humans, too. Is our human brain tuned to process only biological entities? And if not, how similar to us should robots be? Now, in this example, the robot was not interactive. It was not responding to what people were saying or, what, or the way people were behaving. So we still observe some elements of a social connection. But what happens when we have a robot that reacts to people? What happens when the robot closes the loop and processes information coming from the environment and other humans and responds in a way that is socially appropriate to the situation? Let's consider another example. Imagine we could use social robots to support children's learning in the classroom. Such a robot should be able to track a child's learning progress and adapt the level of teaching activity. But we also know that empathy is an important quality in a teacher. So empathy is the ability to understand someone else's emotion and to respond in a way that is socially appropriate. So we wanted to build a robot that could do just that. Watch. In the FP7 project, Emote, we are developing an empathic robot tutor with capabilities that allow it to engage in empathic interactions. To enable a robot to respond empathically, we need to model, interpret and respond to the learner's effective state with appropriate expressive behaviour and pedagogical actions to the current situation. This requires a new channel for expressive behaviour using facial, gesture and posture recognition, supporting empathy in the learning context and increasing the learner's engagement. The robot assists the learner in completing tasks with a range of pedagogical actions. For instance, if the learner is frustrated and having difficulty with a task, the tutor will present the answer, explain it and move on. The symbol is located somewhere over here. So the robot was doing much more than trying to make an estimate of how a child was feeling. It was also trying to connect with them at a more basic and less cognitive levels. For example, it was trying to follow their eye case, their head. And the robot was very positively perceived. Children enjoyed interacting with the robot. They understood that the robot knew when they were struggling. They understood that the robot was trying to help them. They socially connected with it. And when the robot personalizes support to adapt to a child's learning strategies, children's learning increased. But let's put this in context. Why does this matter? Why would we want a robot tutor for our children? For example, we know that there is a general declining interest among students in STEM, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But we also know that STEM is quite important to tackle some of our greatest challenges. So what if we could use a robot to solve this issue? I have two small children, and I would love if they had the opportunity to learn in new, possibly more engaging ways, topics that are difficult to grasp. So what if we could use social robots uh, to promote uh, learning of STEM? Supporting teachers, not replacing them, but providing them with new tools to teach STEM to our kids in more engaging ways. So far, we have seen evidence that humans socially connect with robots. But this social connection is unidirectional. We must know that. What does it mean? Well, robots may respond to our emotions. They may express emotions in ways that are socially appropriate, but they don't feel for us. Robots are not humans. They're machines, which in the best case are designed to interact with us in a way that is socially acceptable, designed to function in social interaction in ways to support us. And yes, 
this could, be done, could become a problem because there's the potential that this social connection is abused. For example, if we start to consider robots as mere replacement for people, not as a support from them, we don't want to replace the human social contact. So it is our duty as a society to reflect on the ethical implications of using socially intelligent robots, to identify potential dangers and ways to mitigate them, to inform future lawmakers, and to do so in a preemptive and not curative way. On the other hand, robotization is happening. And several reports have stated that robotics is now one of a few technologies that has the potential over the next few decades to have the same impact that the Internet has today. And that's huge. And that is in part due to the fact that robots in the future will interact more and more with people. So robots' ability to interact with humans in a socially intelligent way to connect with them, will be fundamental in promoting successful human-robot cooperation. And not only in socially assistive scenarios where we have robots acting as tutors, helpers, uh, companions, but in every situation where human-robot collaboration is necessary. Social robots will change our lives. We will socially connect with them. Robots are not humans, and we should not consider them as such. But why not building robots that are more humane, more compassionate, robots that can understand us, help us, and empower us in our homes, schools, offices, hospitals, factories? And why not using robots as tools to understand ourselves better? Why not? Philosophy is born from wonder. And isn't it wonderful to work with social robots? Find your social robots. Immerse yourself in wonder. Thank you.